Our last talk in the quantum metrology session is by Paul Moreau from the University of Glasgow. Okay, thank you, uh, Sabine, for the, the invitation, and thank you for uh, the, the organizing committee, as well for the opportunity to speak uh, here in Bristol. I'm quite happy to actually uh, come back here for uh, a, few, a few days. And so I'm uh, going to talk uh, about the, the detection and the use of uh, specially resolved quantum correlations with uh, cameras. So it's going to be uh, like a very small and non-exhaustive uh, review of, of, of the topic, but also I'm going to present a um, new demonstration that we've been uh, doing in, in, in Glasgow. And uh, so all those people were involved in the, the Glasgowian demonstration I'm going to talk uh, about, and mainly uh, uh, Miles Paget that is uh, leading uh, the uh, optics group in, in Glasgow. So what are the motivations for uh, actually trying to use uh, cameras uh, to, that are potentially able to detect single photons to detect um, uh, correlations in the, in the spatial domain and really to, to try to perform some quantum optics with uh, such cameras. Well, the thing is that um, in the transverse uh, dimensions of, of a light beam, um, okay. Uh, so in the transverse dimensions of a, of a light uh, beam, you potentially have access to uh, extra very high dimensionality. And um, so before the emergence of the cameras I'm going to uh, talk uh, about uh, today, the only way you could actually access to this extra dimensionality is by using point-like detections and moving your detectors around. And of course, when you're trying to do uh, some quantum optics, the most basic, basic things you want to do with your detectors is to uh, detect correlations between those two detectors. The problem with doing that is that when you've got uh, one uh, detector that clicks on one side, then you'll have to scan the detector on the wall uh, extent of your image or for your, of your beams. And most of the time, you will actually miss the, 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 the twin photons. And uh, therefore, this technique is essentially very, um, uh, has a very bad efficiency and as well is quite, uh, quite slow. So the use of uh, cameras means that we will be actually able to perform uh, parallel measurements and that we will actually um, be able to perform some quite fast and quite efficient uh, demonstrations. So I'm going to, to talk about two uh, main kind of um, uh, technologies today. Uh, so first, the electron multiplying cameras. And uh, in the second part, I'm going to talk about the intensified uh, cameras that both can uh, reach uh, some single photon level uh, content. But so first, the, the, the source that I'm going to um, talk throughout all this uh, presentation um, is uh, the SPDC that I'm sure all of you uh, know. But here we use uh, different kind of uh, nonlinear crystal compared to probably what most of you uh, is used to because we want to get some spatial resolution. And therefore, the crystal we use has to be quite thin but also quite spatially extended along the transverse uh, dimensions. So we pump this uh, crystal with uh, a UV uh, laser that is as well spatially extended. And through this SPDC uh, process, we uh, generate uh, those two uh, infrared uh, photons that are uh, actually entangled. So because those two photons are actually generated at the same transverse position within uh, this uh, crystal, if we actually take two optical systems, two imaging systems, and try to re-image an inner plane of uh, the crystal, what we will see actually is that the two photons are detected at uh, conjugated, correlated uh, positions. On the other hand, if you now Fourier transform this plane optically, so that you look at uh, a Fourier plane, therefore looking at the, the momentum of the photon, because you've got a conservation of the momentum of uh, the pump, you will see anti-correlations and no longer correlations of uh, the uh, arrival of the photons. 
So I'm going to talk first about uh, the EMCCD uh, cameras that are the first uh, kind of uh, uh, technology that you can use in uh, this context. So in contrast to conventional uh, CCDs, uh, those cameras possess an extra gain register in which the photoelectrons are actually uh, multiplied uh, by being uh, accelerated and through then impact uh, ionization. Um, so this process is, is a stochastic uh, process. So the drawback of this technique is that obviously we will um, add some excess noise. However, uh, what we can do is actually apply uh, a threshold on uh, the uh, grayscale images that we, that we get. Uh, a threshold that is just determined uh, by uh, the, the knowledge we can uh, have through characterization of the noise of the camera. And we can then optimize this threshold level. So below this uh, level, we'll consider that no photons were detected. Then above this level, we'll uh, consider that a photon, uh, one single photon is detected. We therefore need to uh, uh, be in a regime where we know that the number of photons per pixel is quite uh, sparse. So then what we can, uh, get is this kind of uh, binary images. And here is an example of a single frame acquired by uh, through this technique of uh, a fluorescence uh, parametric uh, beam in, in type 1 uh, phase matching here. So actually, these kind of images have been uh, used in uh, the past to um, actually detect some uh, subshot noise feature within those uh, single frames. So they just use this kind of ring-looking uh, 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 type 1 SPDC uh, source to just show that they had a subshot noise correlation. So here it's in the far field. So they are imaging the momentum of the photons. And they show that if you select uh, different uh, areas that are, um, that are uh, diametrically, uh, diametrically opposed uh, along this circle, you can uh, show that you've got a subshot noise uh, statistics. Um, but you can actually go a, a bit further than uh, this kind of subshot noise uh, feature. You can actually try to detect a signature of entanglement with this kind of images. Uh, so and for that, actually, so it's, it's a work I've done uh, during my thesis uh, in, in Besançon. And um, so we got inspired by this realization in a Boy Bud's uh, group, where what they did is that they used this kind of uh, type 2 uh, spontaneous par parametric non-converted source. And uh, they use here point-like uh, detections. And what they do is that they leave one of uh, the two uh, detectors at a precise position, and then they scan uh, within the other beam to actually detect, uh, like um, measure the spatial extent of those uh, correlations. So they do that in two setups, one in the near field where they actually uh, do that for position and one for momentum. And then you can compute uh, some kind of um, um, sorry, uh, uncertainty product that is conditional on the detection of the first photon. And if you go actually below the Heisenberg uncertainty limit, it means that you've detected a, sign a signature of an EPR, uh, of an EPR type uh, correlation. So we did that actually uh, with uh, cameras. So again, we've got two setups. In the near field, we uh, just re-image an inner plane of the crystal. And in uh, the far field, we just image uh, so a, a Fourier uh, plane of uh, this uh, crystal. And by using the kind of images I was showing to you uh, uh, before, uh, extracted from do those two cameras, we then cross-correlate those two images. And uh, what uh, we get is actually, what we would expect, is correlations in uh, the uh, near field, so in position in both x and y, so for the two transverse dimensions in the far field anti-correlations. So then we can compute again uh, an uncertainty uh, product and show that we actually go below uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty limit, thus demonstrating uh, the uh, EPR uh, paradox. So an interesting thing is that actually to show that uh, this kind of techniques and the use of those cameras is really efficient, we actually try to improve the efficiency of, of the system and then use only single frames to perform the demonstration. And we were able actually to do that uh, quite consistently. So we just acquired two frames 
for each of uh, the uh, two configurations. And just by cross-correlating those frames, we get a correlation peak on which we can evaluate those uh, uncertainty uh, products. And consistently, uh, for just single frames, we were able to actually demonstrate uh, an EPR paradox. So only for two seconds of acquisition. So that's something that is quite fast. And it is due to the fact that by accessing this high dimensionality, we actually access to um, quite uh, parallel measurements of uh, this uh, phenomenon. So those demonstrations were quite uh, more on the fundamental side. But can we do actually something uh, useful with that uh, and do some kind of imaging uh, that will bring an advantage? So actually, that's something that we've done uh, recently in, 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 uh, in Glasgow, and it was mainly uh, done by uh, this uh, PhD student, Hermes. Um, and uh, what he, uh, we did is that we used uh, this time a, a type 1 FASMH uh, crystal as a source. So we re-image an inner plane of the crystal onto uh, this uh, object that we want to uh, image. And then what we've got after that is an imaging system that is uh, aperture limited, so that the resolution potentially accessible by uh, these uh, cameras is limited by this uh, numerical aperture. And then uh, what we do is that we use actually the fact that we know that in this source we've got uh, correlations we go to a very sparse regime where we know that if we detect two photons close by, then we can, with good certainty, uh, uh, be sure that those two photons were correlated. And then we compute the centroid of those two photons and we keep this centroid as an event. Um, so that's what we did. And this is the kind of images that we obtained. So here, it's maybe probably difficult to see with uh, the, this light and the, the resolution of the, of the screen. And mainly because so the, the resolution improvement accessible through this technique scales as a square root of n. And here we've got only two photons, so n equals two. So the improvement is square root of two. At least it's bonded by square root of two. We do not saturate fully the, the, this bond. Uh, so but here, uh, normally, uh, we could see that this image has a uh, higher uh, resolution, and it is the one that uh, uh, used this technique of uh, correlation, uh, correlated imaging. We can uh, assess that a bit more quantit uh, quantitatively by plotting uh, the modulation transfer function. So it's really plotting um, the uh, contrast in the image as a function of the spatial frequencies that, is, uh, that are present in, in, in those images. And if we do so, we see that the blue line here that corresponds the, the correlated uh, light case, so centroid measurement case, is above uh, those uh, classical uh, lines in, uh, that were acquired in the same uh, conditions. This demonstrating that we've got actually this uh, resolution advantage through uh, this technique. So um, I'm now going to talk about uh, the second kind of uh, technology that uh, can be used, or that, uh, at least that we use in, in, in Glasgow. Uh, so the second kind of cameras, and those are the intensified uh, cameras, so ICCDs or uh, ICMOS. So the way they work uh, is actually that we use just a conventional CCD sensor that is a still uh, a scientific uh, grade, so quite low noise. But the amplification actually happens outside of the chip. And by doing so, we are actually able to control uh, a, a bit more uh, this uh, amplification. And therefore, the noise that uh, those cameras will exhibit will be lower than uh, what you can do with EMCCDs. So what we've got in front of the camera is just an image intensifier, where through uh, multiple stages of uh, conversions to, uh, so from photons to electrons, uh, on, uh, on a photocathode, then through amplification of those electrons in a, a microchannel plate, then conversion back to uh, uh, f uh, like photons, so light, uh, on a fluorescent screen, what we get is that if we send one photon inside this image intensifier, we get a flash of light outside of uh, this uh, image intensifier. And that is therefore 
uh, quite easily uh, uh, detectable by uh, this uh, kind of uh, scientific CCD. Uh, so the drawback of this kind of technology is that compared to uh, CCDs and EM CCDs, the quantum efficiency is actually quite low. So for EM CCDs, we can reach like after threshold something about 60% uh, to 70%. Uh, with uh, this kind of intensified camera, uh, we get something like 10 to 20 percent quantum efficiency. Um, and so actually, uh, what I forgot to say is that you can actually, uh, the way this mic microchannel plate is that you've got uh, like uh, a very high voltage <coughs> that you can get with a very short uh, gates of about uh, 4 nanoseconds, which means that actually you can trigger those cameras conditionally on uh, other kind of detection events that you can get out of like conventional SPADs, for example. And by doing so, actually, you can do two types of uh, things, uh, two types of imaging scheme, one that we call the heralded imaging uh, schemes, and the other one that corresponds to the quantum uh, ghost imaging scheme. So I'm just going to uh, introduce you uh, briefly to uh, these uh, two kind of schemes starting with the uh, quantum ghost imaging uh, schemes. So what we do in, in that context is that we've got our source here in the type 2 phase matching. We've got those two beams. On one of the two beams, we place uh, an object. And then we detect the photons that are, tr are transmitted by this object with a bucket detector. So that has no spatial resolution. On the other side, because we want to use those correlations to reconstruct this image, uh, we place uh, this kind of camera. And by triggering uh, this camera conditionally on a detection event by uh, this bucket detector, that will be a SPAD in our case, we can actually just sum the images that are extracted from this camera. And then what we will get is a reconstruction of uh, this image, even though none of the two detectors taken independently can lead to, to, to an image. So for this one, because it has no spatial resolution, and for this one, because it's not observing photons that have interacted directly at least with the object. So the problem with this kind of cameras is that they have uh, about 40 nanoseconds trigger delay. And therefore, to implement this kind of uh, uh, setup, you need to have an image preserving delay line that is placed in front of uh, your camera. For this second photon, to wait for the camera to be ready for exposure when it uh, impinges onto uh, the uh, sensor. So that's what we have actually here. Uh, here on the right hand side of uh, the sensor, this is this once unfolded 20 meters long uh, image preserving uh, delay line that makes this second photon to, to wait for the camera to be uh, actually ready for exposure. <coughs> and if we do so, uh, you can actually, by just summing the cameras that you uh, get outside, uh, out of this, uh, sorry, sum, summing the images that you get out of this camera, you can get a, reconstruct uh, a reconstruction of uh, this kind of uh, ghost image uh, just by summing those uh, triggered images. Um, and, uh, okay, so that is the heralded imaging. So in contrast to uh, ghost imaging, the only thing that changed is that now the object is in direct view of, of the camera. So why would you do that? In fact, you can use this kind of uh, setup to actually get rid of some of the, the technical noise that you will have uh, if you were not uh, triggering uh, the, uh, uh, so heralding the photons that are detected here. Just because, because you know that a photon has been detected here, you know that a photon is actually likely to uh, actu come in uh, this uh, camera, which means that by getting the camera, you actually only acquire when you know that a photon will be uh, incident on, on the camera. So therefore, you can, by uh, that way, remove quite a lot of the dark noise that you would have uh, with a more conventional uh, system. And by doing so, actually, uh, they were, so it is in Glasgow, but before I, I arrived there, actually, uh, so they were able to uh, demonstrate some uh, quite low uh, noise, uh, uh, so, sorry, low intensity uh, imaging by using this kind of heralding uh, scheme. Now, uh, an interesting thing that you can do as well with this kind of setup, and this is something we've done quite recently, is try to acquire an image of a bale-like uh, violating behavior. 
So the, the setup we use to do that is actually a combination of both heralded imaging and uh, ghost imaging. Therefore, we've got two objects. On one side, in uh, the heralding arm, what we place is, so both are phase objects now. We place uh, a phase step that looks like uh, a circle, so it's a pi phase step. On the other side, we have uh, different objects that we can actually uh, uh, display on this uh, second SLM, and those are just pi uh, phase steps, but with uh, different orientations, different uh, angles here. So why would you do that, actually, in, in the context of trying to demonstrate uh, a, a, like the violation of a Bell inequality? Well, the fact is that you can use, uh, you can decompose those uh, pi FS step on a basis that is a two-dimensional, uh, uh, well, on a two-dimensional uh, space that is uh, an OEM, uh, so orbital angular momentum basis, limited to uh, the, the charge L equals one. So, uh, and, and therefore, this kind of uh, uh, object has a representation on a block point carré uh, sphere. Uh, so here, L equals 1 is somehow equivalent to uh, uh, a right circular polarization, and L equal minus 1 will be equivalent to a left uh, circular polarization. And this kind of object is actually equivalent to uh, a polarizer, linear polarizer, that will have uh, a certain angle compared to, uh, um, compared to uh, a certain um, um, direction. And because actually you've got some out of this kind of source, some entanglement on this kind of state, you can actually use uh, this kind of schemes where uh, actually we use this object because you can guess that along uh, the diameter of this phase circle, what you have really locally is a continuum of those pi phase shifts with different angles, so along this uh, circle. And so what you can do by using this kind of is acquire this camera that is somehow the, the uh, remote interference filtering of this object with those uh, four uh, different uh, uh, pi uh, phase filters. And so what uh, you can do then is to extract this information out of this uh, single image where uh, here we use those uh, red circles. We unfold them and what you can uh, get here is this uh, sine squared uh, looking, as you would hope, actually. Uh, uh, that's we have uh, plotted there. And then you can actually, with this kind of uh, uh, data, you can actually test for uh, a CHSH uh, Bell uh, inequality. And we show that within this image, without background <laughs> subtraction, we were able to uh, get actually above uh, the value of two, just demonstrating uh, the quantumness of this kind of uh, correlations. And uh, yeah. so in conclusion, uh, I, I hope I've, uh, at least I've tried to convince you that uh, using camera is the way, uh, photocontinuing camera is the way to go when you want to access to this extra potentially, uh, extra dimension, uh, dimensionality that can be quite high dimensional that is the transverse uh, dimension of a light uh, beam. And that the use of this camera means that you can access to quite uh, efficient uh, schemes. And in conclusion, I will just say that there are actually new kind of uh, promising technologies in this kind of uh, field of quantum imaging that are the, the, the SPAD arrays. And we've seen as well uh, quite uh, recent and maybe uh, it's quite an, an early stage but demonstration of SNSPD's uh, arrays. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you for your talk. Um, do we have any, any question for Paul? I think we have time for one quick question. Alex. Hi, thanks for the yep. great, great talk. The last bit where you're violating this uh, Bell inequality, mm -hmm. could you explain just somewhat what the state is that you're generating? Like this down conversion crystal is just a standard down conversion crystal? So, so yeah, it is a, a standard uh, type one uh, down conversion uh, uh, crystal. And actually, um, the state that you are uh, generating is uh, quite similar. I mean, is exactly projecting onto this 
uh, Bell Poincaré two dimensional OEM uh, 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 space, it is quite equivalent to uh, an entanglement uh, HV uh, plus. Uh, VH that you have in, in polarization. And that's why we can, we can get this uh, kind of uh, uh, violation. But the entanglement comes from the projection of the SLMs rather than from the state no, generation the, in the, the crystal? No, the entanglement comes from the state. So because this state has uh, uh, on this OEM equals one basis already this kind of structure. Uh, okay, thanks. Okay, let's thank Paul again.